Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Little Big Planet Challenge video. First off, I'd just like to thank you all for getting me to 1,000 subscribers. It's great to see so many people like my content. Thank you for all of the supportive comments as well, I read all of them. For today's challenge, we're going to be trying something far more difficult than anything we've done before, which is trying to answer the question, how many bubbles does it take to beat Little Big Planet? Our overall goal is going to be like the other challenges, trying to complete the final level, the collector, but this time, while avoiding as many bubbles as we can. For anybody not familiar, bubbles are the main collectible found across the Little Big Planet series, and in the first game, they are used to increase your score, contain collectible items, as well as act as the weak point for enemies. These are the three types of bubbles we'll be trying to avoid, respectively named score bubbles, prize bubbles, and creature brains. Collecting a score bubble awards the player with 10 points, then prize bubbles and creature brains are worth 50. So while we're at it, let's also try and achieve the lowest score possible, as well as obtain the minimum number of collectibles to finish the game with. This just means that if we can help it, we'll be trying to not get any of the score multipliers that come from collecting 5 bubbles in a row, as well as not getting any of the points from the race gates that are found in certain levels, either by jumping over them or by waiting out their timer. The score is able to be reduced by letting Sackboy die, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to be ignoring this as a way to lower our total. But since each level awards us with prizes for completing them without dying, we will take a death in each level to avoid those ones. We won't be able to avoid the prizes that come from finishing each level though. Our restrictions will be similar to last time, with the exception being that we're allowed to grab now. We won't be using any create mode exploits, but we will use a lot of the tricks found within the levels themselves, as well as Sackboy's many unintended movement options. I'll be mentioning a lot of tricks by their speedrunning names in this video, so if you're at all confused or need an explanation for them, I'll link to a guide in the description which goes over everything. With the rules out of the way, we can start looking at these story levels. For starters, the introduction doesn't contain any bubbles for us to collect, and it doesn't even have any rewards for finishing the level or for doing it without dying, so we're able to complete it without worry. But in the spirit of avoiding as much of the game as possible, we're actually going to skip completing this level entirely. When playing on a save file that hasn't yet completed the introduction, the game removes the option to return to the pod from this level's pause menu. However, by repeatedly spawning multiple players into the level, we're able to have the lives of the entrance completely run out, at which point, the game shows us the game over menu, where we can simply choose to return to the pod. After waiting through a couple of cutscenes, we can see that the next level, First Steps, has been unlocked, and yet the introduction hasn't even been completed. So from here, we will be needing to complete each level, as the next one only unlocks when the previous one is completed. After loading first steps and running partway through the level, we run into our first set of bubbles, where thankfully we can simply jump over and in between them to get past. There's a bit of tricky movement at some parts, but it's all mostly straightforward, needing to do some strategic jumps here and there. That is, until we reach this part, where the game teaches us about sticker switches. Initially there seemed like there was no way around the wall that the sticker switch lowers, because of how tall it is. But surprisingly, after we get two players over the bubbles by using a trick called the co-op jump, then jumping off the queen, we can use two controllers at once to push over this arrow sign, then get two sack people in between it, so we can essentially carry it most of the way up the hill. Then after this, we can keep pushing the sign up, where the meerkat knocks it into the air, landing in the perfect spot to do a left corner jump off of getting us all the way over the wall. After getting past the gate, there's another long row of prize bubbles to avoid. Initially we used a co-op jump to make it on top of the queen, where we would then land on this one bubble, then jump over the last two. But Ads, whose clip this is, showed that it's actually possible to push the queen over using multiple players, where she can then be moved across enough to be able to avoid all of the bubbles here. Now we can simply lose a life if we haven't already, and complete the level with a score of zero where we're then awarded two prizes for finishing the level. Get a grip is surprisingly a nice break up to a certain point. All of the bubbles are easy to avoid after holding onto the ends of the first horse, then using a right corner jump to get onto this wall to then jump this gap to avoid this section's bubbles. Then there's a couple of different ways to get around this wall without the horse. There are now practically no problems until reaching yet another gate that is locked by a sticker switch, except this time we have a horse that we're able to utilize. After going behind the screen to avoid the prizes, it's possible to do a precise jump off the sponge to clear the entire wall. From here we can jump over the race gate, die if we haven't, and run to the scoreboard. 
finishing with a score of zero and being awarded another two prizes. From here I won't be mentioning needing to die in each level as there is always many opportunities to do this and it won't be a challenge. In Skate to Victory, the windmills are easy enough to get past until the final one. The last windmill needs to be grabbed in a certain way and at the right time so that we fly in front of the wall, then grab the bird to avoid the ones on the hill here, skipping everything in this section. This level does have the windmill reloading trick, which skips everything, but we're going to be avoiding it in this video for multiple reasons. The platforms up to the button in the castle are blocked by some score bubbles, but a left corner jump off the sponge is enough to reach the top. The same thing can be done in the next room, but the left corner jump is combined with a co-op jump. The next section has two options. The first is to go all the way to the left and jump in between the wall and the boot as it goes upwards to avoid the bubbles that are in front of it, landing on the right in between the score bubbles. The second option is to barely jump off the right of the boot as it goes upwards to land in the same place. Jumping over the remaining bubbles, we can make it to the ramp that gets pulled down, where care just has to be taken in moving and running up it. Riding the skateboard down is easy enough until reaching the queen with this pyramid of bubbles. To avoid this, we can simply get a precise jump off the top of her, then time a run underneath the star sticker. There may be many obstacles throughout the game which can be cleared in multiple different ways, like jumping over the star instead, but for simplicity, I'll generally only be showing one method. Finally, we can finish Gate to Victory with another score of zero, being awarded two prizes for completion. From here on out, I'm also going to stop saying the number of prizes awarded for each level, as going forward, every single level awards us with two, aside from the construction site, the terrible Oni's volcano, and the collector, which each give us three. I will discuss these prizes again at the end though. Now moving on to the second world of the game with Swinging Safari. The drafts at the start here are covered with bubbles, so we'll have to do a trick here called Subclip, which lets us shoot out of the submarine to the top of the stage. We can then do a couple more hard jumps, where we'll then need to drop back in bounds, where we'll be about halfway through the level. By precisely dropping down on the branch, we can make it to below this giraffe, where it can be grabbed in a way that lets us maneuver around all of the bubbles. Then a similar thing can be done on the next three as well. Now we can easily swing over these three bubbles, jump over the race gate, and complete the level with another score of zero. Burning Forest has one of the most difficult beginnings since all of these platforms have bubbles right in the middle of them, but we're able to abuse the fact that the game lets you wall jump off of the sides of each platform after being burnt. We can then use this all the way across until we reach these three bubbles, where we'll have to grab one since there's no space to jump over them. Swinging up to the back layer lets us avoid the bubbles here to then start riding on the buffalo, where we make it up to the bridge. It's tight, but it's possible to jump in between all of the bubbles while making it to the top. After avoiding the next ones, we have to ride on the very front of one of the buffalo to go underneath all of the bubbles. Everything is relatively straightforward up until the first main drop with the zebra sponges, where by grabbing the first one, it's quite easy to drop down and avoid everything. The second drop is a bit harder since the sponges all have bubbles attached, but what we can do is stand on the crocs and use the front layer to drop in front of them all the way down until reaching this hidden ledge. Finally, we time a jump off this croc's mouth to clear the gap while avoiding everything. From here we can head to the scoreboard with a score of 10 from the one score bubble at the start. The main route for the Meerkat Kingdom is absolutely filled with bubbles, and even after going out of bounds and skipping most of the level, the ending is still too difficult, if not impossible to do without grabbing any bubbles. Despite this though, this level is probably the easiest in the run. By using an exploit named Deloading, we're able to partially remove the collision of the wood that the entrance of the level is glued to, by spawning an additional player, then despawning them at the correct time. Again, if you'd like an explanation for any of these tricks, I'll link to a speedrunning guide in the description. Now we can simply fall through the collision that we just removed, where we'll find ourselves directly next to the scoreboard. We can then finish with a score of zero. The first half of the wedding reception is pretty easy, with timing a run onto, then off of the trampoline, and jumping over the enemy. Then, this prize bubble and the balloons can be jumped over. The real challenge starts once we reach this bouncy skull. To avoid everything, we have to get a bounce up and over to the next skull, to then get another bounce to go over again, since that one is full of bubbles. Next, a super high bounce from the next skull can completely skip the next section, since there's bubbles all over the elevators. The next part is where we start to have problems, because the only way to progress is across these platforms, which each have at least two bubbles on them, and the path across the top isn't any better because of the prize bubbles up there. 
We're going to be grabbing one bubble on the second, fourth, fifth, and sixth skulls each, then two on the last one, making for a score of 60 from six bubbles. Thankfully, the next section is more forgiving. It's not too hard to get several low bounces across the skulls on the bottom to go beneath everything. For the final obstacle, we have to grab at least two bubbles while we go straight to the top, where we can then finish with a score of 80 from eight score bubbles. Like the last level, the first part of the darkness is quite easy as you follow the dog. There's enough space to pull the bridge down while avoiding everything, to then narrowly jump around the bubbles near the spikes. Once the collector steals the dog, the bubbles on the elevators can be avoided by grabbing onto the light attached to the ship to be taken to the top. The next bubbles can be jumped over and then behind. Then for the next set, moving into the back layer allows us to get as close to the spikes as possible without touching any bubbles, so we can precisely jump around the next ones. After we swing over the next set, we need to get a second player over so we can do another co-op jump. This lets us grab the top of the next skull, so we can ride it across while avoiding all of the bubbles. We jump behind the candle prize, then for the next part, it's a tight fit, but a jump can make it by while avoiding everything. We can go behind these bubbles again, then for the part with Don Lu, it is a bit difficult, but it's possible to push him and the bubbles the entire way without needing to collect them. Then the button can be barely pressed to get him up. From here we don't need Don Lu anymore, so we can leave him behind, making jumping over the next bubbles easier. Unfortunately the tunnel leading to the elevators is too narrow to get a jump over the bubbles, so we need to collect these four, putting our score at 40. The elevators themselves each have three bubbles on them, but we can do a left corner jump to avoid the first three, then we'll have to collect two bubbles on the next two skulls each, making our score 80. The final platform has bubbles all across it that are too close together to jump in between, but thankfully, by jumping on top of the butler, we can swing across the first platform before it falls down to get all the way to the right, where we only have to grab two bubbles on the last platform. Now we can head to the scoreboard with a score of 100 from 10 score bubbles. After all that, we can finish off the world with an extremely easy level. In Skulldozer, there are many bubbles which are constantly getting flung around and in the way, and surprisingly, it is actually possible to make it through while avoiding everything, but here's an easier way. Once we jump over the race gate, we can do a trick where we respawn ourselves before the Skulldozer activates, so we can get on top of it. Then we use a second player to activate it, so it starts moving. From here, we can simply just sit on top and ride the Skulldozer all the way to the end of the level, jumping off before it falls. Now we can finish the level with an easy score of zero. Starting off Boomtown, we need to use Devante to make it over this prize bubble. Then unfortunately, we have to grab the next one, as there's no way around this area. Once we're on this platform though, we can do a bounce jump to above the next platform, where we can then make it over to the next section. To get over the cacti, we're able to push the blocks over in a way that lets us left corner jump off them while still being stacked up. The fireball part isn't a challenge, and the town area is easy enough if we take the correct route. Now there is a trick using the rocket car that skips the whole level that we could normally use, but doing it puts us right in line of this prize bubble, so we won't have access to doing it. But the entrance to the bomb section is also filled with bubbles that we can't avoid, so we need to skip it somehow. Thankfully there's another skip using the scorpions later in the level. After jumping over the prizes, we can get a swing up to the collector as he comes down, to then be taken upwards where we can jump out of bounds, letting us run straight to the scoreboard, completing Boomtown with a score of 50 from the one prize bubble at the start. To start the longest level in the game, the mines, these enemies are completely blocking the path, but it turns out, that we can just barely get underneath their spikes to push them out of the way. The same thing can be done on the next enemy too. The first minecart ride isn't a challenge until we have to push another enemy out of the way, which is followed by another easy section upon reaching the new type of enemy. It's easy enough to run underneath them, but the cannon at the end launches us into many bubbles. Thankfully a left corner jump is enough to reach the top of this section, where we can then run on top of the cardboard to avoid the bubbles in front of the sponge. Next, a precise drop is done to make it to the next minecart, where we can ride it to the end with no issues. After the elevator section, we can jump over the race gate, then proceed until reaching the second button. We jump over the bubbles as they fly towards us, then we can do a bounce jump into the back layer to get over the rest. The next minecart is a little difficult. We need to run the start of it on foot, as the bubbles are too low to dodge while in the minecart. Then we jump back in before the fire, where we can then go underneath the rest of the bubbles. Here's another enemy that's blocking the path, which is too big for us to push with our body. But instead, 
we can use the small part of its hammer that isn't covered with spikes to get launched over it. The wheel section has us taking a slightly different route than normal, going underneath here to then fire boost and jump at the rest of the gap. The bubbles on the hill are too difficult to jump over normally, so we'll need to get a second player down here so we can do a co-op jump over them. The final minecart ride is pretty straightforward, we just need to be careful when jumping into the second one. Then on the last spinning wheel, a precise swing between the bubbles is enough to let us fire boost to where the enemies are. Finally, the third enemy can be pushed over, where we can then run straight to the scoreboard without any more trouble, finishing with a surprisingly low score of 0. The start of Serpent Shrine greets us with more of the enemies from the previous level, and while it's a bit more difficult, they can still be pushed over so that we can progress. The rest of this section's bubbles are easy enough to jump around, where we're then greeted with another enemy in our way, except this time, we're able to go completely underneath it. Shortly after, this snake enemy gets in our way with no way to move it, but instead, we're able to go back and use the serpent's tunnel after getting boosted from it to get past the snake enemy. The section with the bouncy platforms is tight, but for the most part we're able to make it through, except for needing to collect at least two bubbles on the second one, since the tunnel is curved here. Like before, the snake enemy gets in our way, and the only way past is going through the serpent's tunnel again. Except this time, it's a lot more challenging as we need to get a wall jump to get back in bounds after boosting off of it. Once we're up here though, we can head to the right while avoiding all of these bubbles. Falling into the gas here lets us delay the second serpent spawning, which makes this jump a lot easier. The bridge near the enemies collapses when reaching within a certain range of it, making it difficult to clear because of the awkward angle that it rests at. Since the enemies are in the way already, we can use them to our advantage by pushing the lower one onto the bridge, then using it to completely jump over the trigger for it breaking, making this section a lot easier. From here it's pretty much a straight run to the finish line, as there are no more bubbles in the way of the main path, finishing Serpent Shrine with a score of 20 from two score bubbles. The Metropolis marks around the halfway point of the run, and Lowrider sets us up with a pretty easy one. We can't drive the car because of the prize bubble that's in it, so we have to walk the entire distance. Once we make it here, there's a couple of precise jumps off the cars, where we can then actually drive this one, and complete the next section as normal, until we have to leave the car behind. Even if we avoid the bubbles in this section, we're not able to make it past the next ones. But instead, we can drive the car backwards slightly, so we can get a high bounce up to the metal. Then we can drop down to the orange car. The next platform has bubbles too high to jump over, but it's quite easy for us to fall out of bounds, by using the electricity on the wheel to block the layer change, where if we then move in the right way, we can fall back in bounds where we'll be in the two player area. From here we can backtrack until we find the final car that we're meant to drive, except we can't move this one either because of the prize bubble inside, so instead we'll walk down until reaching the bouncer, where a co-op jump is enough to make it over him. Now we can easily run to the scoreboard with a score of zero. Subway is another easy one. At first it seems difficult because of all of the bubbles in the elevator and the rest of the level, but thankfully there's a pretty big skip here. By lining up these boxes with mags in the right way, we can do a double left corner jump up to the lamp here, where we can then swing and jump off of it to make it onto the roof. Now we can simply take the correct route out of bounds until falling down at this section, where we land right at the end of the level before the elevator ride. After using the crane and taking the elevator to the top, we can jump in between the bubbles and run to the scoreboard with a score of zero. The race gate at the start of the construction site is one of the easiest to jump over, and the entire first section isn't a problem to get through without touching any bubbles. The first two seesaws with bubbles on them need to be stood on briefly so that they fall off, then the third one can be cleared by doing a left corner jump off of it. Like in the mines, this enemy with the moving hammer can be jumped off of at the right time to skip it, then the next section of the level alone has several bubbles in the way of the path, which may be avoidable, but since there's actually a major skip here, we won't be needing to deal with them. By using the enemy with the hammer again, we can get a precise fling off of it, so that it sets us up to get a left corner jump off the metal as we go past, ultimately launching us up through this small gap in the roof. Once going through the gap, we land on a ramp which leads directly into the room for the boss fight, all we need to do now is finish the fight as normal, and head to the scoreboard, finishing with a score of 0. Endurance Dojo has a nice start with only a few tricky bounce jumps up until past the ninja poles, where we grab the green wheel low enough to not collect its prize. The easiest way to clear the next section is to go straight to the last rotating platform by doing a bounce jump off of the first one, 
From here we can get to the checkpoint after jumping over the sushi. Because of how the next bubbles are positioned, we can't easily make it through the next section. Instead we can use a co-op jump that lets us get on top of this upside down coat hanger, then we can do a massive jump from the top of the stone to skip everything. The bubbles on the next platforms take up nearly all of the space, but by timing specific jumps with the right cycles lets us barely get through while only needing to touch a few of the platforms. Next we can walk behind the sushi and do a careful jump to go around the first red wheel. Then we can fall behind the second one to make it to the last ninja pole obstacle, which sadly is covered with bubbles. The best I've done with getting through here is 5 bubbles, and that was with some lucky jumps, but I don't doubt the lower number is possible. We'll be taking a score of 50 for now though. Getting to the top beam again lets us avoid the sushi easily. Then following that, there are more rotating green platforms. It's more difficult this time, but it is possible to again make it through while avoiding everything, by timing jumps with the right cycle to skip some platforming. Next we can jump the race gate, use the bouncy platform to make it onto another coat hanger, then do another large jump to reach the elevator. These bubbles are easy enough to jump over, then the next red wheels can be avoided by simply jumping off the edge. Now we can get to the scoreboard with a score of 50 from the 5 score bubbles. And now it's time for Sensei's Lost Castle. If you've seen the video where we tried to complete all of the story levels without using the grab mechanic, you'll remember that this level was the most intimidating just because of how many obstacles are normally passed by grabbing them. Most notably, these spinning wheels. We can already see that nearly all of the wheels are covered in bubbles, so let's just see how many we can avoid. Getting past the wall at the start is pretty easy. Then the ninjas require some interesting movement to avoid everything there, which is difficult, but still possible. Then up the stairs is the first wheel. The bubbles on this one are actually far enough apart to grab it while not collecting any, but unfortunately it throws us right into this prize bubble. We could probably get around it if this section didn't restrict us to only one layer, but sadly we'll have to collect it for now. For the next section, we can skip the second red wheel completely, but we'll have to grab at least one bubble on the first and third wheels each and then two on the fourth one because of how close the bubbles are together. We can get away with grabbing only one on the next wheel, then jumping in between the rest to make it to the top of the room, getting out with a score of 100 from those five score bubbles and the one prize bubble from earlier. These bubbles and this enemy can be jumped over. Then we'll take one of these balloons to get to the bottom of this part safely. Here's another wheel. At first it seems like we'll need to grab another prize bubble, but as it turns out, we can reuse the balloon in a creative way. Even though they're in the same layer, it's possible to get the balloon past the checkpoint by pushing it against it in a certain way. Then we can take the balloon and fly it very carefully in between all of the collectibles, including a key, which may be the first and only time that one of them is actually a threat. After the wheel, some precise jumps can make it through the spike section to reach more red wheels. Thankfully the first one doesn't have any bubbles on it, so we can use it to get to this platform. Then we can grab one bubble on each of the next three wheels, clearing the section with a new score of 130. The bubbles here are normally in the way, but getting a jump on top of the sponge allows us to glide over them. And now another part where we're forced to collect bubbles. All three of the drops for the zipline have a row of bubbles that we're only just in range to collect. The first drop is skipped, but for the second and third ones, the best I've done is five bubbles, collecting two at the second drop, then three on the third. With a score of 180, we can run past the next ninjas easily until reaching more green wheels. Since it's the only way to progress, we jump in between the bubbles on the first wheel, and then collect 3 on the second and 5 on the fourth and sixth wheels each, being careful not to achieve a multiplier, putting our score at 310. We've got most of the level finished now, and honestly our score could be a lot higher, but the level has just been saving the worst until last. The next two rooms contain three enemies, one of them being a mini boss. And like all other enemies, the way we have to defeat them is by popping their brains, which all award us with 50 points each. And we're not even allowed to just skip them this time, since the doors only open once the enemies are defeated. The first room has two enemies, which each only have one brain, giving us 100 points. But in the second room is the boss fight, which has a total of five brains that we need to pop to progress, giving us another 250 points, putting our total at a disappointing 660. And if that wasn't enough, we then immediately need to collect at least another two score bubbles in the next section, where we're at least able to skip a couple of the grabbable ninjas. The final zipline looks bad, 
but we can do another bounce jump to get on top of the branches so we can easily walk down to the scoreboard. After the two bubbles we collected in the ninja section, the final score for this level is 680, by far the worst score we've achieved yet. But who knows? For the grab challenge, this was also the worst level until a ton of improvements were found making it 70% better than before, so maybe more developments will be found on this level that help us avoid most of these bubbles. With all of that dealt with, we can move on to finishing off the island with its final level. While flying the balloon in the Terribleoni's volcano, there aren't really any bubbles that get in our way. We can make it through most of the first fortress without issues, there are just some tricky jumps needed to get around the ninjas. The second fortress is mostly the same until reaching the spikes on the bottom floor. There are bubbles right where we land after jumping the fire, but we can actually get on top of the spikes to make it over. For the next jump, we just have to fire boost to clear the gap. Once we fly the balloon into the volcano, we find what is probably the hardest part. After landing between the bubbles, a tight jump can be made to make it in between the next ones, where we then fire boost off the jumping fire at the right time to make it over the next bubbles too. The next platforms have unavoidable bubbles on them, but we're able to use a co-op jump to go straight up to the next area. After this, several precise jumps can be made on the edges of the platforms until reaching this spot, where we can just land on the lower rock to make it to the end. Finally, the boss fight. The fight itself doesn't have any bubbles in it, but the bridge that appears afterwards is covered in prizes. We would need to grab at least one to cross. Instead though, we can actually do a trick during the fight, where the main player gets flung over to the right by the boss's knife, where another player then defeats the boss. After this, we're left on the right side of the bridge without needing to collect any of the prizes. Now we can walk straight to the scoreboard with a perfect score of zero. The second last world begins with Dancer's Court, where after pulling out the stairs, we're given a stack of bubbles in a narrow tunnel, which we'll have to take one from. But afterwards, we can avoid everything up to the moving platforms by bouncing up and around all of the bubbles here. It's a bit tricky, but doing a right corner jump while this platform is moving lands us on the second last one, where these bubbles are too close to the fire to jump underneath them. Instead, we can set up a pretty unusual moving co-op jump on the platforms to get over. The next moving platform section isn't too difficult, and the part where we move across the dancer's arms is fine as well. The following moving platforms has a jump in between fire and bubbles that we actually can make. Then doing some strategic movement can get us past the circular moving platforms. The next platforming section is a little hard with landing on the moving platforms, but once we reach the third platform of this area, a specific jump needs to be timed so that we can land on the right side of the next one safely. Now we can move through the next section, fire boost here to avoid these bubbles until reaching the snake, which has bubbles all across it with no way around. Thankfully there's another major skip here, which will help out a lot. By timing a jump off the snake at the correct time, we can land all the way at the top of this wood, where if we then do a right corner jump and fall off this ledge, we can land directly at the scoreboard, skipping the entire rest of the level while still only having a score of 10 from the one score bubble at the start. Sadly the beginning of Elephant Temple isn't too great either. We can clear the first part fine, but at the rising platform, the space is too narrow to easily avoid all of the bubbles making the best I've done, collecting three of them. And then for the stairs afterwards, one bubble needs to be collected to make it up. Short hopping or fire boosting can avoid the next ones, and then carefully timing our run can have us go underneath all of the bubbles at the player sensor section. Unfortunately these stairs are an issue too, except now we need to collect two of the bubbles. Once we're up here though, there isn't even enough space to get enough speed to jump over the next bubbles, but we're actually able to use another deload here to help us out. By narrowly activating the checkpoint, then spawning a player in to deload it, the entire wall behind the checkpoint loses its collision, meaning we can fall back down, move back a layer, and walk into the next area. Also, it says change to create mode on the pause menu because I've been playing these levels on a create mode version. Surprisingly, a lot of these tricks are too hard to do non-segmented. Anyway, once we're here, we need to first move the grabbable platform over to make it up. We can't pull it because of the bubbles, but doing a co-op jump over all of them lets us push it over instead. And now instead of climbing back up the stairs, the easiest option is to do a left corner jump off the sponge to make it up, our score currently being at 60. Because of the fire in this player sensor section, we can't walk underneath everything like before, making the best I've done for it three bubbles. The part up until the next player sensors isn't too bad, where the same thing applies again. The best I've done here is another three bubbles, putting our score at 120. With the right path, 
the moving platform section can be made through pretty easily, where we now have to use another player again to get through the next part. When the levers here get pulled to raise the platforms, they get completely covered in bubbles. But here's a trick that we can do instead. We have one player standing on the edge of the first rising platform as the main player pulls the lever. From here, the second player can jump straight over to the lever on the left, where if they then pull it, the platform on the right that the main player is standing on gets lifted up and we've cleared this section entirely. The path until the elephant isn't a challenge, including the two rooms with the moving boxes and the wave section. However, the part with the elephant is a little difficult. The path up to the button that lets the elephant progress is covered in bubbles, so the best we can do is co-op jump to the second highest platform and grab two bubbles, then right corner jump over to the button while grabbing another two. After this, we can simply ride the elephant to the scoreboard and finish with a final score of 160. We can now finish the temples with Great Magician's Palace, where the first few spawning blocks can be made through easily, only having to time a jump off the second last one to make it to the checkpoint. Here at the player sensor section, the platforms are a little too small to avoid every single bubble. The best we can do at the moment is to grab the 2nd, 9th and 14th bubble, while doing some precise movement to avoid the rest, getting out with a score of 30. The bubbles at the falling blocks are too low to the ground to walk underneath, but funnily enough, you're actually able to climb onto the roof here by jumping in between it and one of the falling blocks. Now all that we need to do is make it across by timing jumps to not move back a layer. The bubbles here can be walked under, then the path until the jumping fire can all have its bubbles jumped over. For this part though, it's just a matter of carefully jumping between the fire and the bubbles to get across. Then after running past more fire, we can death abuse to skip the bubbles at the top of this part, where we then have to deal with more jumping fire, except this time, we'll use it to our advantage. To avoid jumping into the bubbles here, we're able to drop down below them and then have the fire push us back up to the sponge. We can then do this again, followed by a couple of right corner jumps to make it to the draggable platforms where we carefully pull them out to make it through safely. At the last fire jumping section, some more right corner jumps and another fire boost can get us both over and under all of the next bubbles. From here we can ignore the key and finish the level with only a score of 30. Starting the final world, we begin with the frozen tundra, where up until just past the dog section has almost no bubbles in our way. The falling icicle section is a little challenging, but it can be made through by using the edges of all the platforms, and same with the next section. It isn't too hard until we get to the next checkpoint. Here we have to climb up these platforms that have bubbles all around them. It would be immensely difficult doing this part without touching anything, not to mention the ice slide section later on. Thankfully there is a pretty useful skip we can do just before the icicles. After deloading this checkpoint, we can go through the wall and then fall through a specific part of the level, ending up at the very end of the ice slide without any bubbles collected. The last obstacles to get past are these two enemies. We could probably just jump over them, but we need to get the soldier past as well so we can open the door for us. But instead of killing the enemies, we can bring a couple of boxes over from the left and use them to get him over the first one. Unfortunately the next enemy is too long to push the soldier over, but after we pop the first brain, we can get him on top of it, at which point he'll be in range to open the door for us. Now we can easily climb over and finish the level with a score of 50. The start of the bunker is pretty easy until we hit the first enemy, where we need to use a co-op jump to get over it. Then after the next part, we'll do another co-op jump to get over another enemy again. It's difficult to just go over the next wheel because of the prizes that are here, so it's significantly easier to just jump through using the middle piece, then a precise jump can avoid the next prize bubble near the rotating platforms. The rotor tube section seems like we won't be able to make it through without collecting a few bubbles, but as it turns out, we can get a right corner jump off the first one as it rotates to land all the way up near the sticker switch where we then just run down and through the next section with ease. For the second enemy in the following part, a co-op jump would be difficult to get over it because of the prize bubble that's in the way. Instead though, we can bounce jump into the back layer to then drop down at the right time to get past the enemy. We can jump over the next one, then start looking at the green car section where a row of bubbles blocks the path without a way around. The best way right now is to collect two of the bubbles and then dodge the rest. A lot of precise and well-timed jumps need to be used for the section with the rotating electricity, but it's more than possible. Right after though, is another long enemy with three brains, where we have to do another co-op jump to get into the back layer to go above it. Now we can get into this wheel, followed by a tight drop past all of the bubbles to get to the conveyor belt. This part isn't a problem, 
but after we pulled the lever to move into the big wheel section, we're met with another narrow tunnel that has bubbles blocking the way. So unfortunately the wheel isn't of access to us unless we want to collect them. There are several different ways to skip the tunnel and the entirety of the wheel though, and the one that's most useful to us right now uses the lever here. By doing a left corner jump followed by a trick called a lever fling, we were able to get launched up all the way to on top of the door. From here it's a simple case of getting a jump off of the box to get completely out of bounds, where we can take a walk to the scoreboard, skipping the wheel entirely, finishing with only a score of 20 from two of the score bubbles. Probably one of the most memorable parts of the next level, the collector's lair, is right at the beginning where we're made to slowly fall through this maze of electricity and bubbles. While it is fun, we need to find a way around to not collect anything. By grabbing one of the sponges that are given to us, we can actually get it jammed underneath the entrance. Then once it's stuck like this, we can do a left corner jump to get up and out of bounds. Now we can run to the right, do a right corner jump and fall off the edge, skipping a considerable part of the level. Once here, we can get inside of this cavity, which helps us skip all of the bubbles in the next room. Sadly we need to grab a couple of bubbles to make it back to the top though. After this, we can make it through a decent amount of the level pretty easily, as most of the platforms here don't have bubbles on them. The next challenge is at the part with the rotating angles. Through the normal path, there are bubbles in the way of a few places, which may be avoidable, but an easier solution is to get flung on top of here, where we can then easily walk across to the right. But now we have to get back in, so we can fall down to the bottom. The best I've done while falling down is collecting two of the bubbles, putting our score at 40 now. The next bubbles can all be jumped in between, putting us at this moving tunnel area. It's narrow and difficult to do, but precise jumps at the right times can get us through this whole area without touching a single bubble, putting us right next to the magician. The following areas have quite a lot of bubbles and a few narrow sections. It might be possible to make it through while avoiding everything, but since there's actually a skip using the magician here, we'll be using that instead. Normally we're able to left corner jump off the lever here, which gets us on top of the cage. We just have to collect at least one bubble while doing so. But actually doing a deload on the checkpoint here, removes the collision of the walls next to it, which actually allows us to move far enough to the right while doing the left corner jump to avoid all of the bubbles. Once we're up here, we can run off to the right, landing between these bubbles where we can then make it to the next lever. But after this, there's another section like at the start that's full of bubbles that we're expected to drop through. But surprisingly, we have a skip for this as well. Back up to where the lever is, if we pull it for the cage to start opening, we can quickly do a lever fling before it gets too high, which has us land in one of these little areas. Now we wait for the cage to stop rising, drop forward a layer, and we'll be out of bounds. Now if we just fall down to the right and keep running, we'll be directly at the scoreboard, skipping the king and queen section as well, having us finish the level with a score of 40 from the four score bubbles. We've now finally reached the collector, the last level. And if you remember this stage at all, you should already be able to tell that we're going to have some problems. Mostly because this entire level is just one big boss fight, consisting of three phases. There aren't even any score bubbles in this level at all. There's only one prize bubble. But there are many, many creature brains. Once we get out of the carriage and head down the elevator, we can start the first phase of the fight. The way the battle works is that we can't move to the next phase until we finish the current one. And since the walls are so tall here, we have no choice but to finish the first phase anyway, popping the two brains on each side, giving us a score of 200. The second phase begins with the Collector spawning two enemies, and while he doesn't start moving again until they're defeated, the third phase would still begin if we were able to pop all of the active brains on him, which there are currently six of. So it may be possible to use two players that are constantly co-op jumping to finish the fight while completely avoiding the enemies, but it hasn't been proven yet. Instead, we're going to be using the enemies to help us for now. Normally the brains in the middle of the Collector's hands are only accessible once you've defeated at least six enemies, where he starts to constantly punch down with them revealed. So to avoid a second set of enemies spawning, we can do a trick using the first set of enemies called the bubble jump, where if we time a jump as we're popping its brain, the jump combines with the pop to launch us high into the air. Using this, we can reach both the brains in between the collector's hands early, only having to use a co-op jump to lure the second enemy back to the right. Then all of the remaining brains for this phase can be popped, just before the next set of enemies get spawned, adding 400 to our score. I will mention though, during the second phase it is possible to get out of bounds by getting flung over to this light, and then using it to go over to the final area. And while it does look promising since we can run to where the scoreboard appears, 
Nothing actually happens until we get the collector from behind this wall over to it, and we can't move him because he's glued to some dissolve, which doesn't just appear until the fight is completed. So all of this isn't an option for us, but it is cool to know about. Back to the start of the third phase, this one has a total of 7 brains that we need to pop, but it's a lot more straightforward than the last one, since there aren't any enemies. Once we pop the last brain and add another 350 to our score, we can jump over the one and only prize bubble, and then chase the collector to the scoreboard, finishing the final level with a massive score of 950. And that's all of the levels, so let's start going through our stats for the run. Our grand total score across the entire story mode comes out to 2260, from us collecting 81 score bubbles, 27 creature brains, and only 2 prize bubbles. Given that there's a total of 1098 prize bubbles across all of the levels, this means we only had to collect 0.18% of all of them. I'd love to also know the percentage of score bubbles and creature brains popped, but unfortunately there's no easy way of counting how many are in each level. If we then also factor in the prizes for completing, acing and collecting everything, we were only rewarded with 53 out of 141, or 38% of those prizes, which all came from the rewards for completing each level. Adding this to the count for the prize bubbles comes out to a total of 55 out of 1,239, or 4.44% of all prizes collected across the entire story mode. As well as this, we were able to collect 0 out of 25 of all of the keys, and only complete 25 out of the 55 levels that are in the whole game, including minigames, which is less than half. Here are also how all of the pop-up menus look, with how little stuff they have in each of them, as well as the scores and stats for each individual level. This took an incredible amount of time to document, record, and just put together. So I'd just like to thank anyone who helped out with any of it, especially Ads, who I used their clip of in first steps and for help lowering the score, as well as Generist, who also found quite a few significant improvements once I finished the initial route. I hope you enjoyed watching. I'm not sure what my next challenge video or project will be, but it sounds like there's a few good ideas out there from all of you. I'm always happy reading suggestions. I'll see you next time.